Great, and you will have time to ask any of your questions after the presentation is finished. So I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today. Butch Schomber has been serving the rotary die cutting industry for over 40 years. He started with Rotometrics over 20 years ago as a territorial account manager. For the last 10 years, Butch has turned his field expertise toward product development and innovation. Working closely with tech support, web fab, and the sales team, he continues to develop innovative solutions to the day-to-day -day issues our customers experience. So I'll turn it over to Butch. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining and investing your time for this presentation. I hope that you and your families are safe and remain healthy during this challenging time. <clears throat> Our target message today is how to achieve better results, increase output with faster press speeds, and minimize shutdowns due to improper die care and handling. We have about 30 minutes to cover our topic, so I'll try to focus on the most important parts of flexible die care, handling, and usage. Let's start with a brief description of, of the Maxis brand and what we offer. Maxis Corporation is a unique source of end-to-end -end solutions for a worldwide market of rotary converting challenges that continue to develop. With fast-changing material offerings and tighter tolerance demands from your end users, the Maxis family of products offer a distinctive, distinctive solution that can update existing equipment as well as support the OEM machine builders with world-class durable products. From unwind to rewind, we offer sophisticated tension control units and world-class web guiding products to track your web through press with high quality precision rollers that can control ink and adhesive transfer with proprietary coding properties. We have many customers reporting a significant reduction in press shutdowns due to stoppages to clean or replace rollers for multiple times per shift to now for days or weeks without lost production. Those testimonials can be seen on our website. We also offer a full line of world-class magnetic cylinders along with rotary cutting tools, both solid and flexible. We finish up at the end of the press with sophisticated intuitive slitting units to prepare roll whisks to assist in meeting your customers or your own in-house production requirements. Maxis is a world leader in end-to-end -end solutions. One-stop shopping, if you may. Today, we're gonna to focus on flexible die cutting dies, what you can do to minimize die cutting issues, and our goal is to keep your lines running longer and faster to ultimately save you time and money. Let's talk about uh, what you can do uh, to minimize die cutting issues. So first, I think what we need to do is identify all the influences uh, that play a role in proper die cutting. And I think you'd all agree that web tension uh, running speed, we're going to talk about material. I think the importance of a durable, heavy-duty die-cutting platform, especially when attempting to cut thin films or to thin liners, is greatly important. We're going to talk a little bit about pressure settings, image layout, cylinder deflection, of course, stripping methods, and our thermal expansion. So die care and handling do play an important role in this process, and we're going to kind of touch upon a lot of the subjects. So first, we have to start with die wear is inevitable. You know it, I know it. Dies are going to go dull. And the first person that's going to see that is the operator. And it may be a corner that's flagging or a, or a leading edge that's flagging. And what does he normally do? He reaches up and he applies more pressure to the cutting die to get through that job, uh, which is fine. Uh, but it, as you pull the parts out of the web, you will notice that they're fuzzy. They have fuzzy edges. They got ticks. They're not cut clean. The pressure allowed him to finish the job, but the pressure is really not the answer. You have to look deeper into the situation. Prepare, perhaps, after that job is run to get that die retooled for the next time uh, that you plan to run it. And, of course, a duller die, as you apply more pressure, is going to create a heavier liner impression because the blade tip is wider and you're hitting it harder. You're not allowing the blade in its profile to do the job that it was made to do. So it's going to throw sometimes some heavy liner impressions that could cause a problem in QC. So we have to, in order to maximize die life, we really have to understand the factors that, that play a role 
in shortening tool of life, abrasive materials. So that could be inks, coatings, or whiteners. As we all know, white is not a color. It's a pigment. It's a Ti2. It's titanium dioxide. And it's an adjunct or an additive to material to create the white color. It's very abrasive. It's a mineral. So if you know that you're cutting very white, or you know if you're cutting or laying down two or three uh, coats or, or layers of ink, uh, or your material has a thermal coating, let, let your customer service rep know that. Prepare for that in advance, and you'll get the right tool for the job um, to, to, to fill your needs. So sharp corners and points. Uh, those are all also something that's overlooked. Everybody likes to order a sharp point or a 90 degree. It is advisable that if you could break that corner with a slight radius, even if it's 10 or 15 thousandths, which is barely noticeable by eye, you will stop that material from wanting to force itself into that sharp corner, usually uh, resulting in the corners are the first thing that go uh, dull, which again allows more pressure or forces more pressure to be applied to the die. Uh, excessive pressure is not going to help you. Uh, the proper pressure to put on a die is the lightest pressure it requires to perform its job. Um, the clearances have been set, the blade profiles have been determined by the material requirements, and let the die do its job. Pressure is not your answer. Lubrication. Most presses come with bear wipers. Uh, I've seen a lot of presses that they've been removed from or literally not used. It is really important that those bear wipers, which are small felt wipers that press up against the bare area of the die or the bare area of the anvil or both would be great. And they're lubricated on a regular schedule to keep things from, uh, from uh, friction because friction causes heat. And as things heat up, dies tend to expand. As die bearers expand, we start losing cut quality so the operator applies more pressure and the circle continues. So lack of lubrication equals friction equals heat equals pressure. So we, if we can keep lubricating, we can better control life of our tools. The bear wipers also serve to remove debris. Paper dust is a byproduct of what we're doing. We're bursting papers all day long. That dust is going somewhere and logically it's going to go where we have lubrication. So. It'll clean them, it'll keep them white, uh, wiped clean, and everything will run truer. Uh, we are going to touch on deflection and diameters and how that affects die cutting. But let's talk a little bit about the right die for the right application. So paper uh, has a very low burst strength. And an analogy that I've always used is a butter knife uh, through a newspaper, and it pops through very easily and does a good job. Uh, so in that case, if, if that's our desire, long life is what we want, we can go with a wider blade profile, giving you the wear resistance against the abrasive paper, remember it's white, or the inks that we've put on it, and because of its low burst strength, I'll get longer life with a wider blade profile. On films, whether it's a thin film face or even trying to cut to a thin film liner takes not only tight tolerance tools, but very sharp tools because films normally have a high burst strength. So again, that butter knife uh, is going to stretch that face stop, possibly even bursting the paper carrier, or at least in, in applying a, a, an impression to that liner. Um, excuse me, please. making a liner strike that what we need. So cut quality and blade profile are very, very important. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about blade angles. And now we're going to jump to material specifications. And I just want to kind of share with you that I'm in a room with an automated light. So if I don't move, the light's going to shut off and I apologize. Um, so we go into material specifications and communicating uh, within your order of what you're doing and what's important. So the description of the material becomes very, very important. We not only want to know uh, the weight. So many times we've always over the past years described the materials as a 40 pound liner or a 50 pound liner. Uh, the weights, that's great. 
Uh, but really what's more important to your die maker is the thickness of the material. And you can get this information off of your material supplier's spec sheet, and it'll give you a liner thickness, of course, plus or minus the normal 10% uh, tolerance. Uh, but at least if we know uh, what they're specking it out at, it helps your die maker kind of focus on a clearance range that they need to start at. We need to know that if you're cutting inks or if it's coated or if it's abrasive, because we then can make suggestions in coatings or treatments that can be applied to that dye to lengthen its dye life and to resist wear. Uh, papers and films, again, we talked about the burst strengths being high or low. Uh, whether or not you're adding a lamination, many times customers order dies and say paper 40, but they have full intent to say 50% of the time we're running a laminate. Well, it's really important to know because again, that laminate's burst strength is much higher than that of the paper liner or the paper label. So we, again, if we know it, we may sharpen that blade angle to help you do both, keeping in mind sharper blade angles are not gonna last as long as say a wider profile used for papers. Uh, thin films, I mentioned, take high tolerance flex dyes and magnetic cylinders. What we're trying to do is achieve and to overcome that high burst strength of the film, giving you liner impressions that can be high speed applicated. Um, multiple layers. If, if you know that you're cutting a piggyback or if you're laminating uh, another layer of material to your final product, communicate that with your customer service rep because it leads us to blade depth. We want to make sure that we have the clearance to cut the material in blade height, not in die cut clearance. Label, layout, uh, sharp points, leading or trailing, stripping methods. Again, these are topics that you can talk over with your rep uh, to get the proper and highest press speeds expected out of a, a die position on, or a cavity position on a die. Here's where we're going to talk about automatic or, or hand uh, applications. So liner strikes, it's going to be a big topic in this presentation, uh, whether it's machine, which is high speed. Normally the liner is peeled across the sharp peel bar under tension. And if we hit the liner too hard and fracture that silicone, the adhesive is allowed to to wick into the paper fibers of the liner, which is going to keep the liner not coming off excuse me, going to keep the label not coming off the liner and not applicating under high speeds. So simple terms were hand applied. We know the consumer is going to be peeling off the liner by hand, so we can hit hard. Hard liner strikes will equal longer die life. But if it's auto applied and we know again that we're going to be under tension and busting over a bar, we want to control that liner strike. And we've got a section on that that we'll cover here in a minute. <clears throat> so, as you enter a die, you have two choices with Rotometrics. We have uh, the most sophisticated electronic online managing ordering system available. Um, you go on to myroto.com. It's a source for easy quotes. You fill in the simple uh, information or the fields of, of dimensions across, dimensions around. You supply a material. Uh, description. You basically fill in the fields in the request form and it will generate not only a, uh, a couple of choices of dyes that we might recommend, uh, but you will be able to determine at what pricing based on your job length or your requirements, what best fits your needs. Not only will it help you quote quickly, it will also allow you to order quickly. So once that quote becomes an order with a one click switch, it turns It'll turn your quote into an order electronically. You'll be able to use MyRoto to track your, your product through the shop. So we understand the importance of your production schedule. And by monitoring it through our system, um, you'll be able to watch how it's traveling to make sure that it's going to be delivered when you plan on it being there. Because again, your production schedule is our, is our goal. 
Um, you'll also be able to go in on your solid dies and see how many times they've been retooled, when have they been retooled, possibly predict when to reorder a die based on its history, what material what it was made for. So you'll be able to trace any of the die orders that you place through Otometrics by your part number, your purchase order number, our serial number. It'll give you a clear description of the specifications and what it was ordered. And if you'd like to reorder or simply do I own it? We sometimes make a lot of dies that are already owned and they're duplicating inventory because they can't find it in their shop. So look for your part number, duplicate that die. You can check its shape by looking at a visual die line review, making sure that it's the tool that you need. Quick click reorder and you're up in business. So as we go from ordering, we're going to talk about how do we prepare now dies to run. So the first step, of course, is unpackaging. So when you receive that die into your facility, it'll be in a box or a core, depending on whether you ordered it with a pre-curl or not. It's an it's a inventory choice. It's a diameter mag cylinder question, uh, but you'll get it either way. So what you want to do is you pull the, the die out of the box and visually inspect it. Look for damage. Confirm the specs on the PO uh, that it matches that information which is on our packing slip. So we will have the dimensions and the spacing and the material that it was made for. And it'll share all of that information. So confirm that the die was made correctly. Check the sample retains that we include in every die that we ship. Is it the liner strike that your customer is expecting? Is it the liner strike that your QC department is hoping to find? Make sure we've met your requirements. Keep those certifications and the returns on file because you might use them later for either troubleshooting or for quality purposes. Once the die is set up, we suggest that you run and strip a full repeat of that die, pulling each cavity out individually, looking for hairs, looking for ticks, looking for uncut areas. Is there damage to the die? Is it cutting cleanly? This is long before you set up anything so that waste is reduced by verifying that the job is correct before you start. Inspect that liner. Uh, do a liner stain if you'd like. Make sure that it falls into your quality requirements. So here at Rotometrics, we use what we call a go, no go liner strike test, which I show here on my screen on the left uh, is what we consider to be light line. I've struck that silicone, but I have not fractured it. I have not broken it. I've not exposed paper uh, fibers from the carrier liner. Like somebody needs to mute, please. Uh, on the right is a heavy liner uh, where you can see the silicone has been fractured. That ink has been absorbed into the liner. And if I flip it over, you can clearly see the strike on the heavy application. That's indicating to you that that liner has been weakened and be careful with it on an automatically applied job. So whatever your job requires, light or heavy, this is a simple go, no go process of confirming that you're getting what you need before you run a lot of labels or create a lot of waste. So once the die is inspected and everything is good, what you want to do is make sure it's clean and ready to be mounted onto your cylinder. I would suggest covering your work area with a foam pad that can be changed regularly because we want to make sure that that pad remains clean. As you see, we've turned the die upside down and we have now the blades in contact with that foam surface. So we have to be careful that there's no staples, Allen screws, razor blades, all of those things that we have every day in our job. The razor blade, I think every press ever made came with a razor blade, uh, but kind of keep it away from the work area so that we don't damage it. They are very fragile. Jewelry, a bump with a ring can put a flat spot on the tip of a cutting die causing a, a tick or a non-cut area that again is going to cause you production speeds. Make sure the back of the die is very, very clean before attempting to mount to your mag cylinder. I recommend denatured alcohol over isopropyl alcohol because isopropyl is more of a petroleum-based product and it will not leave an oily surface between your flexible die and mag cylinder surface. So to minimize possibility of slippage, 
Again, I, I recommend denatured alcohol over isopropyl. So once the dye is clean, of course, we're going to mount it to our flexible dye. So you're going to wipe off the surface of your mag cylinder, which we're going to touch more on. We're going to make sure that it's clean of dust and paper, debris, masking tape or whatever. And we're going to mount the dye with two hands solidly on the describe line, keeping it and maintaining solid control of that dye so it doesn't kink or bend. What we want to see is our registration marks perfectly lined up, showing us that our dye is now running parallel and true with the center line of our press. To remove it, we also recommend using a plate lifter. Peel the corner lightly up. Be careful how you peel it off because it's easy to kink, crack, or bend a flexible dye, which will in future use cause it not to lay properly down onto the surfaces of the cylinder obviously causing die cutting problems. So as you remove the mag cylinder, or excuse me, when you remove the flexible die, we want to make sure that it's stored properly. So either stored in the original packaging that it came in, or you can from Rotometrics be supplied uh, storage bags that can be hung in a very small area on a coat rack. So we have the large 28 by 38s and a smaller 19 by 26. You'd be surprised at how many tools can be inventory in a small eight foot area by utilizing these storage bags. And on the front of each one, there's an area that you can document run length, job numbers, die serial numbers, die pressures, whatever information that you might need next time uh, in order to run the job again properly or to monitor footage run so again, you can be ahead of the game in order or, or replacement. So when we talk more about mag cylinders, we want to talk some of the basic differences or the, the terminology that we use. So there's a difference between the diameter of the bear and the body diameter. And that difference is referred to as diff or drop. Um, that's the air gap between the cylinder body and the anvil roll surface that is going to allow us to manufacture a flexible die to be mounted or wrapped on that mag cylinder, leaving what we call clearance between the very tip of the blade and the surface of the anvil. So TPH is a term that we use to describe the measurement or the thickness of that flexible die from its backside all the way up to blade tip, TPH, and the difference of TPH to the anvil surface is referred to as clearance. I have shown here images of the scribe line that's across the cylinder that'll make sure you're square and true. I've highlighted the center mark that's on the cylinder, which is also duplicated that on your flexible die so you know that you're centered in your web line. So line all those up, make sure everything's true, understand that when we ask what mag cylinder you're running, why we're asking you that, because we're trying to determine diff. Diff plus TPH equals proper clearance. So when we talk about mag cylinders, I want to talk about diameters. Um, a rule that we try to follow here in our building is we want more around than across. And simply put, if I have a 10 inch web width, my minimum diameter mag cylinder or repeat mag cylinder should match that of its width. So we would say for a 10 inch press, the minimum diameter mag cylinder that we would recommend would be 10 inches. Now we will kind of break away from that golden rule a little bit. We might go down to nine or nine and a half, but be concerned that if today you're cutting lineals and have no deflection problems, tomorrow if you're cutting a nine inch wide re rectangle, diameter will play a role and you could get deflection. So larger diameter mag cylinders will always perform better. The dies wrap smoother around them. Your dies will last longer because they won't crack. When you try to take a flexible die with a lot of cutting blade on it and adhere it or stick it to a small diameter mag cylinder, it does what I call I-beam. So it's exaggerated, it's a stop sign, and that's the way it is mounted 
on the cylinder. So as the die rotates, you compress your flat sides because it's allowed to give and then spring back. The result is improper die cutting, uh, especially on films. So a dollar saved on a cylinder today be by choosing a smaller diameter may end up tomorrow costing you quite a bit more. So try to follow the rule. It's a good idea. Um, it's just a recommendation. Let's talk a little bit about mag cylinder care. So we talked about cleaning it. So that's great at removing the ice. Our denatured alcohol is great at remo removing adhesive, perhaps, or paper dust. Um, but what it won't do is remove the metallic dust from this huge magnet in your work area. Um, many shops say, well, we don't have any reason to have uh, metal shavings floating around in the room. Any operator that's in attendance today who has never mounted a die uh, where the gear runs up against anvil roll surface and chamfers the little edge uh, is either, like I said, brand new or in denial. Everybody does it. We all do it. Those metal chips are going to find that 100-pound magnet that's sitting five feet away from it on a work table. So my suggestion and what I do is I barber pull the surface of my mag cylinder using like a blue painter's tape. It leaves no residue when I remove it. But when I do, I'll take all those metal chips with me. So it's highly advisable that you do it. How often you do it is up to you. But if there are metal chips on the surface of your cylinder, no matter how much wiping you do with alcohol or a lint-free cloth, all you're doing is moving around that chip. So if your die cutting problem tends to move, you have a cut through and you replace, remove the die and replace it, and the cut through just moves to another place, that's really a good indicator that there's some contamination on the surface of that roll, and I would suggest uh, removing it with tape. Don't bump or drop these. They're, they're pretty fragile. In other words, if you dent that magnetic surface, your die does not have anything to seat on when it's under full pressure. So you could get a tick there. So be careful about the work area when you lay it down. I really do recommend using V-blocks to set your cylinders up on for cleaning, for loading, for uh, uh, die installation. Anytime that that is not in the machine or in the box, it should be set on a set of V-blocks. Um, watch for moisture and humidity. Every dye that we send out contains a little blue, uh, chemically treated humidity controllable sponge that helps with humidity while in storage. So don't throw that pad away. Keep it in the box. It'll help, oxi it'll help from oxidation building up under your rolls. If the roll happens to oxidize and you do get a little bit of that discoloration, simply wipe it off with a Scotch-Brite pad and a little WD-40 or CLR. You're not trying to remove metal. All you're trying to do is polish the oxidation off. And never store a mag cylinder with a flexible die attached. That's just asking for humidity to build up at the mating surface and you pull that die off and it'll be bright red and rusty. Again, now you'll have cutting issues. So be careful how you storage because, again, all of this care is going to come down to liner strike, clearance, and cut quality. So as we talk about cut, die cutting description, I have a diagram here of, of an auto-applied, no liner strike um, expectation. So there on the left, you see where I have burst through the paper, through the adhesive, but I have not fractured or in any way cut into the silicone release liner. That's a perfect liner strike if that's what you're after, zero, zero result. For cutting too deep, simply, I've come through the face, I've blown through the adhesive, I've fractured the silicone liner. More than likely, my, the, the paper fibers of my carrier liner is wicking adhesive, and that label is going to be very, very difficult to apply through an applicator because it's going to want to remain on the surface of the carrier face. Cutting too light is the opposite. I've not fractured through the face completely. I've not burst through the adhesive. Therefore, if it strips, which I don't think it will, it's going to be very difficult and you're going to have to slow down that press tremendously to get any result or production off of it. This is a really good time that we talk about what a rotary die cutting blade actually is doing. 
Uh, we use the term cutting, uh, but what it's doing actually is that it is bursting the material. So it is taking your sandwich of, of layers of the face stock, the adhesive, a silicone, and a liner, and it's compressing it to its thinnest point. And when it gets to the point where it can't be compressed anymore, I'm going to burst the layer that I want to, a controlled depth burst, if you will. Now, what we will do is, again, we're looking for clearances. We've set TPHs. We've added blade angles and clearances. We've done all the science to get it to burst to the depth that you need. Communication is going to be the key, what you expect and what you're after. If your results are different than what you thought, again, look at the retains that we've sent you. Look at the retains on the machine. Might be something off, might be overpressured, might be whatever. But this is how we describe a perfect die cut, and we got there through science. So your die is not cutting and you're troubleshooting. So everybody says, why is my die not cutting? At that point, I would say, well, the first thing we're going to question you in trying to solve the problem is, did it happen? Did it stop cutting immediately? Or did it gradually uh, stop cutting over time? Because the two of them are as easy as it sounds. It's a, it's a great question because many times the person who's calling us really don't know the answer to it. If, it's cut, if it stops cutting immediately, we, we have to assume that it's mechanical because if a die cut yesterday and you have samples to prove that it did, or if the die cut during the setup and you have shown that through your own QC testing, if all of a sudden it stops cutting, something mechanical is playing a role. Whether it's bearings, whether it's pressure, whether it's material changes in the role, I'm not sure what it is, but those have to be where we go first in finding out what changed. If they wears out gradually over time, that could be simple die wear caused by dies being made wrong with clearance. It could be material that's abrasive, with double bumps of white. It could be things that are influencing the wear of that die that we're going to have to dig deeper in to find out what wore the tool out. Is it the same label in each revolution? Because if it is, it's probably a die problem. Now, where the damage happened or how the damage happened, we're not looking uh, to worry about that. What we're trying to identify at this point is, why is my die not cutting? So again, go back to the retains. Did the rotometric samples show the bad spot? Did the samples on your setup show the bad spot? When did the bad spot show up? That'll help us lead to where we need to go to get you fixed and get you back and running. Check pressures, because if you look at your bag or if you look at your specs, and rotometrics can supply you with the testing pressure of the die if you ask us to, look at the pressures that the operator has it set up on. Is he overpressured and deflecting something? Is he underpressured and not controlling and getting that burst that we need that we built the die for to achieve the result? So check your die pressures. If you've run the job before and you have a history, did it run at the same pressure now as it was ran last time? Adhesive buildup can also be an issue. And it, as adhesive builds up on the die, you know that you're changing the angles and the engraving that we have, we have put into that tool. And that blade as it paddle wheels in and out of your face stock or in and out of your material will be affected and kind of held off by that adhesive. That adhesive buildup conversation leads me perfectly to, in, to a rotor repel adhesive control product. This was the Label Industries Global Awards winner in 2018. It still continues today to be the number one non-stick coating, non-stick treatment uh, for not only adhesives, but for ink buildup. Uh, people are finding that cleaning the rolls using Rotopel has become simpler, whether it be an idler roll or a cutting die. Uh, what used to take hours to clean with solvents now is taking possibly minutes with a warm, wet rag. Uh, they're finding that they can use it on their idler rolls and their stripping rolls, not only their dies. So Rotorapel continues to perform. It continues to be the standard of, of what's available. And if you haven't tried it, uh, you should give it a give us a call because I believe that the cost of the upgrade to Roto Repel can easily repay itself uh, in in as simple as a as a shift. 
So we started all of this with die wear is inevitable. And as I said at the beginning, um, our message today was to highlight the importance, the importance of cleanliness, handling of your flexible dies and mag cylinders. We have the data to prove that if you implement these simple practices, you will dramatically increase die life and decrease magnetic cylinder wear, which will easily translate into immediate cost savings. It all starts with choosing the best die for your specific application. By partnering with our experienced customer support team and utilizing the Roto website, you can feel confident that you will be getting the best advice to ensure faster press speeds, increased productivity, and reduced downtime. We really enjoyed today, and I'm hoping that you found it useful. Uh, we plan on an ongoing webinar series. We have one coming up on September 10th called End to End Solutions, September 30th, Optimizing Converting Performance, and a Precision Roles webinar, which is yet to be determined date-wise, but we're also going to have product demos. So I mentioned filling out a survey. I'd A, be very interested to know how you think we did today, but more importantly, what topics may you want to talk about the next time? Uh, we're going to highlight, again, product demos, online events, and trade shows. Jessica? Yeah. Thank you, Butch. Thank you, everyone. So that was the end of our presentation today. And if you missed the beginning, don't worry, we will be sending out a recording of the entire webinar. Right now, we have about 10 minutes to answer any questions. Um, you can use the message icon and type in a question, or you can unmute yourself by clicking the microphone icon to ask a question out loud. So does anyone have any questions for Butch? All right. Anything in the chat room, Jessica? Um, so John asked a question. You mentioned at the beginning the different Maxis products. Who do I call for that? Great question, John. Um, so Ro Maxis Rotometrics, Maxis the brand, has set up a phone number, and it's 1-844-MAXIS. And if you're anything like me, Trying to find the MA is a challenge. So it's 1-844-629-2377. And if you contact that number through prompts, you will be led to a person who not only will be familiar with the topic that you want to talk about, but be able to help you uh, by answering questions and leading you to where you, where you need to go and, and, and determining what solution would be best for you. So I would, I would suggest uh, the 1-844-MAXIS number as a good way to get into that, that, to answer that question. Anything else? Nobody wants yep. to pick on me today? You can feel free to type in your question or you can ask it out loud by unmuting yourself. Um, ben asked, what's the difference um, between dye for paper versus film? Okay, so again, paper has a very, very low burst strength. So I can, in order to achieve longer dye life in paper, I can actually take the engraving and the finishing angle of your cutting blade and go wider with it, which is going to withstand wear much better. It supports that cutting edge. Uh, where, as if I'm trying to cut thin films or a stretchable face, a synthetic face, I need to go sharp because I need that burst to happen quicker um, than uh, quicker than the paper liner that's holding it or the liner that's supporting it before it bursts. So paper dies, I can go wider blade angle e equals longevity. Film dies, I, can, I go a sharper blade angle, uh, which is cut quality and liner strike quality. So those are the simple differences between the two. We have a question from Paul. How can I get my magnetic cylinders verified in tolerance? Great question. So we have a team of, uh, of field representatives uh, that, that handle our customers and we offer uh, field audits where we can come into your shop 
we can measure uh, the, the can first inspect the condition of your mag cylinders, making sure that they're still within spec, measuring the diff between, again, the bearers and the bodies. And what we will do is take that information and supply you with the condition of the cylinder, um, what the diff is. We, if you choose to keep it at that, you can, but now you're educated in what diff you have. We will put it in our inventory system. So as your CSR goes to your product, your item lists, and we call up a specific mag cylinder from your inventory, we would have updated from original specs, if they're different today than they were, we will have updated that information to what your diff is today, make your dies or adjust your dies TPH to match the new clearance of the mag cylinder. So your die cutting results continue to be as expected, even though your cylinder perhaps uh, has had some wear. They will also inspect the products um, and might offer suggestions of lubrication or replacement due to damage or run out between the two journals or bearer areas. So they'll fully inspect your entire inventory um, to help you again. Um, our goal is optimization of your equipment. We want faster speeds. So there's a service that we offer that that uh, is available simply for the asking. Did that answer your well, okay. Um, there's a question from Lee. You mentioned non-stick adhesive coatings. What other coatings can you offer in terms of longevity? Okay, so for longevities, we can offer a couple of different of coatings. They're all basically chrome-based. Um, won't go into a whole lot of detail because some of them are proprietary, but we can offer two different styles of chrome and three different if you would, thicknesses of each one of those chromes that for achievable for, for an expected result. In other words, I can take a normal chrome and flash chrome a die. I know that it's going to protect it against corrosion, but it may not be the best issue uh, for wear if I'm cutting an abrasive material. I can take that same chrome, apply a thicker coating, and expect wear resistance and longer die life. We have a secondary version, um, it's a challenger project um, that is much harder, um, that is more durable. Again, I apply it at a level for one reason, that's die wear and abrasive resistance. So we have a couple options. So again, if you allow us or share with us the information of what you're cutting, and we can determine how abrasive it is. We do have a couple of options that might help you uh, length and die life a little bit. I hope that answers your question. Great. We have a question from Joshua. Um, if I have a material where my support liner is bursting before my face stock cuts, would this be caused by improper die blade angle, pressure, press speed, or other considerations? This was seen on a fresh out of the box tool. Okay. Um, if I answer the question the way that I heard it, my first response is going to be that blade was not, that die was not probably made for the right material. So we talked earlier about laminations and films. Um, did you check the strikes that were in the box? Did the die cut the sample material properly? Was it tested on the right material? Because normally what's, what I, when I see that, and I'm not sure where, whether or not you mentioned it, but if a film face stock does not cut, but the paper liner bursts, that tends to lead me to believe that that die is not sharp enough to, to do that. Now, as I say that, what kind of liner are we trying to cut to? So if it's a craft liner and it's, and it's thick and soft and it's varying in thickness. Uh, a lot of times um, foam tapes can come on them, uh, but they're irregular and very spongy. That is a different problem. So while the die might uh, be borderline um, cutting successfully, it could be because that liner is not supporting the face stock 
and it may be, um, and I don't know if you said whether you were cutting through or cutting heavy, but it may be a difference of uh, either changing the liner, changing the spec, or accepting that this particular film face on this spongy liner is not going to work. So feel free to call me, we can talk about the details, but that's my immediate response to your question. Great, we have time for about one more question. Mark asked, what are the blade angle differences or the range of the differences between engraved dies and flexible dies, or are they both 60 to 75 degrees? Um, on our, our on our normal products, I think that it, it a big answer to a big question would be yes, they're all going to be in that range. Um, the difference between the two products, of course, is is the the height of the blade. So flexible dies being so shallow, if you will, a standard flex die might be eleven. Uh, the, the die height might be only eleven thousandths. 12 thousandths tall. I can't go very thin with that because uh, the pyramid uh, isn't very tall to begin with. And if I go too wide or if I go too narrow, I'm not going to get good penetration and good cut. But I will say that whether flexible or solid, I'm in the range of 60 to 75, 90% of the time. Rotometrics does offer, uh, especially on solid tools, sharper blade angles, dual blade angles where I might be able to or I will put one angle on the inside of the cavity one on a different one on the outside to help with adhesive bleed to help with adhesive whipping uh, to help with coining to help with clean edge cut so we offer a whole list of optional blade angles but simple question to your answer is they're normally always going to be somewhere in the engraving part of the die not the finished cutting tip, but the engraving sides of the pyramids will be between 60 and 75. We modify the very tip or the finishing tip of that die to match your materials. Great. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. Um, in order to respect your time, that's all that we have for right now. Again, um, you can contact us with any feedback or questions by calling one 844 maxis by going to our website or by asking it in the survey that will be sent out to you. Along with that survey, we will send a recording of the meeting so you can go through everything again. You can also see the beginning or any parts you missed. Thank you everyone and you can close the meeting now. Thank you very much for attending.